Okay, this DVD is taken from an article that I wrote called Questions for Those Who Claim the Supreme Beings of the Nations Are the True God. Now I have some questions for those of the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People movement with adherents such as Don Richardson, Daniel Kakawa, Richard Twiss, who's deceased, Terry LeBlanc, Danny Lehman, Aloha Keakua, YWAM, as well as many in the emergent church. And the questions arise from their claim that the supreme beings of the nations are all the true God, YHWH, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now you can read more on this subject in our book called Idolatry in Their Hearts or in the WCGIP section of my site at deceptioninthechurch.com. My main question for them is this. When did any of the patriarchs and prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles or Jesus Christ in the New Testament ever claim that the supreme beings of the nations were Elohim, YHWH, the one true God. Let's look at some examples in the form of questions and you can check out the source links on these as well. First of all, did Abraham claim that the God who called him from Haran was the same as the god Baal of the Canaanites? Genesis 12, 4 says, So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Now, the word for Lord in capital letters in that verse is the name of God, YHWH, the I am. Baal, on the other hand, was a false god of the Canaanites, not YHWH. The supreme beings, it's not just being, but beings of Canaan were actually a polytheistic couple, Baal and Asherah. We see that many times reiterated in the Bible. And that's the way it was in all ancient cultures, because they were all modeled after the false religion of Nimrod and Semiramis at Babel. That's where we get polytheism today. Did Joseph, upon being taken to Egypt, tell the Pharaoh that they'd always been worshiping the true God by the name of Amun or Amun. Jeremiah 46, 25 interestingly says, the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, I'm about to bring punishment on Amun, God of, of Thebes, on Pharaoh, on Egypt and her gods and her kings and on those who rely on Pharaoh. The God of Israel, thus the God of Joseph, said he would bring punishment on the false supreme beings of the uh, Egyptians and the leaders who worshipped it or worshipped them. The supreme beings of it, Egypt were not just, it, it wasn't just Amun, it was Amun and Mut. That was his concubine or whatever, wife. Did Moses, Moses, after going up to the mountain of God, come down and tell Israel that their worship of the golden calf was good because it was the same thing as worshiping YHWH. Exodus 3, 32, 8 says, They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, that brought you up out of Egypt. The golden calf is contrasted against the true God of Israel by Moses. Now, interestingly, the golden calf was not only an idol which was made to take the place of YHWH, but actually it was the symbol of the Pharaoh, who was to be considered as a god by the Egyptians. Uh, I have this from a research paper. Quote, I have established that the only god specifically called a golden calf by the ancient Egyptians in their writings is Pharaoh in the Old Testament pyramid text. These texts, texts exist into later New Kingdom times in reworked formats. In these texts, Pharaoh calls himself a golden calf, born of heaven, 
who wishes to be allowed to board the sacred solar bark or boat which carries the sun god each day across the heavens. Pharaoh was called the son of the sun, and in the New Kingdom times he was just called the sun. In letters from Canaanite princes addressed to Pharaoh, uh, to the Pharaoh uh, Akhen Akhenaten, and that's uh, circa uh, 1350 to 1334 BCE. So Israel wanted to go back to Egypt and actually back under the rule of Pharaoh, who was to be worshipped as a god. Did Joshua, in conquering the nations in Canaan, claim that Baal was a true god? Well, in Judges 2, 8 through 13, it says, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnah Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. After that, whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. Another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals and forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. During the um, time of Joshua, the people of Israel worshipped the true God, by and large. But a generation after Joshua died, they turned away from YHWH to the worship of Baal and Ashtoreth. The supreme beings of Canaan were the Baals and Asherahs. So did Elijah test the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel for a good laugh? Because Baal was really the true God? 1 Kings 18.21 Elijah went before the temple before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. The whole conflict was between the false god Baal and the true god YHWH. I'm here to tell you that modern inclusivists would have never had this showdown. Why? <laughs> it would have shown that their inclusivism was a bunch of garbage. Actually, the supreme beings of Canaan, again, were the Baals and Asherahs. Did Jonah tell the people of uh, Nineveh to repent of their god El, who was not Elohim, but the consort of Athirat? Jonah 1, 1 through 2 says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. And again, in Jonah 3, 1 through 5, it says, When the Lord... And when the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I, gave you, I give you. Jonah obeyed the Lord, the word of the Lord, and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Now, again, anytime you see the word LORD in capitals in English Bibles, that's the word for YHWH. YHWH sent, jo sent Jonah to Nineveh, and when they heard that God was going to judge them, they repented. Jonah then got angry because they were Gentiles who worshipped false gods. Now, according to Wikipedia, the origin of the name Nineveh is obscure. And it's possibly meant originally the seat of Ishtar, since Nino was one of the Babylonian names of that goddess. Actually, actually El had a consort whose name was Athirat, and they were the supreme beings of Nineveh at that time. They were not worshipping the El who is YHWH, but a generic singular El, which means God. El actually means God. It can be used for a false god or a true god. They were continuing in the polytheistic worship of Babel, which was the worship of a male and female supreme being. 
Did David tell the Philistines to continue to worship the god Dagon because he was the same as YHWH? 1 Samuel 5.7 says, When the men of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us because his hand is heavy upon us and upon Dagon our God. Now you'll remember that the statue of Dagon fell down twice in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant and finally was ruined. And the men of Ashdod admitted that their God was different than the God of Israel. The supreme beings of the Philistines were Dagon and Derseto. Inclusivists of today would say that since Dagon was a supreme being, that he was a true God. And they would get Bible translation societies to include his name in the Ashdod Bible. Did Daniel tell King Nebuchadnezzar to continue to worship Marduk as the one true God? Daniel 4, 37 Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time that my, that my sanity was return, restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne, and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt, and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything He does is right, and all His ways are just, and those who walk in pride He is able to humble. Well, that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He had been taught a lesson by the Lord YHWH, so that he would be humbled and recognize who the true God was. You know, you'll remember that he had built a 90-foot statue of either himself, Nimrod, or, Mar or Marduk, since Marduk is a direct link to the worship of Nimrod. The supreme beings of Babylon were Marduk and Astarte, and that was actually, according to everyone who's in the know, that was a continued worship of Nimrod and Semiramis. Did Ezra and Nehemiah ask the Persians if they could rebuild the temple as a tribute to the Persian god Ahura Mazda? Ezra 7.19 says, Deliver to the god of Jerusalem all the articles entrusted to you for the worship in the temple of your god. The king Artaxerxes ordered that the temple implements be returned so that they could eventually rebuild the temple of the god of Jerusalem. Now, this was not the Persian gods, but the true god. The gods of the Persians were a polytheistic couple, namely Ahura Mazda and Spenta Armati. Did Paul use a clever missiological technique by telling the Greeks that God is Zeus, or the Romans that he's Jupiter, or the Ephesians that he's embodied in Artemis? Acts 14, 11 through 18. When the crowd saw that Paul, what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in the human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called uh, Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates, because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But... When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their way, yet he has not left himself without a testimony 
He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in your seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Now this situation is entirely consistent with Paul teaching over and over again that the Gentiles do not know God. Paul was there to bring them the gospel, not to syncretize their own God with the God of the Bible. And that's exactly what he did in the Areopagus, also when he explained to them uh, who the unknown God, the altar to the unknown God was. And most of them did not want to actually hear the truth. When we go through scripture, we find that in many places, it says that the Gentiles did not know God. Galatians 4.8, you did not know God. 1 Corinthians 1.21, the world through wisdom, wisdom did not know God. The world does not know us as it did not know him. 1 John 3.1, Romans 1.28, he gave them over to a depraved mind. 1 Thessalonians 4.5, the Gentiles who do not know God. Probably one of the strongest statements, Ephesians 2, 12 through 13. The Gentiles are without hope and without God in the world. Finally, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 says, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the supreme beings of the Greeks were Zeus and Hera. And Zeus actually had a number of consorts, spawning a whole pantheon of gods. Jupiter and Juno were the supreme beings of Rome, again spawning a pantheon of gods. Artemis was a virgin goddess, never married, but actually was the daughter of Zeus and Leto. So, in conclusion, the obvious answer to the questions I've posed from both the Bible and historical records is a resounding no. Joshua 23, 7 says, Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. Psalm 96, 5 says, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Micah 4, 5, All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we, Israel, will walk in the name of our God, of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. Zephaniah 2.11, The Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys all the gods of the earth. Distant nations will bow down to him, all of them in their own lands. You know, there's only one name, Jesus Christ, under heaven, by which men may be saved. Acts 4.12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And yet, these new false teachers claim a person can be saved by general revelation of quote-unquote God without the revelation of Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus said, John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, this is abundantly clear in their messages and videos on this subject. The, and now in the new book by Don Richardson called Heaven Wins, that they are inclusivists and they believe that all the nations of the world have a supreme being who is the true God. This is not true. The WCGIP and, and the Emerging Church Heretics also cannot answer the many verses in the Bible that state that the Gentiles did not know God. That type of teaching that they are doing is the final step in the apostasy and constitutes a grand delusion and a new radical replacement theology where the one true God of the Bible is replaced by supreme beings from all over the world in all cultures. And Israel is replaced by all the nations. They've even help the Bible translation societies to put the names of false gods of the nations in the Bible. Now, for further information on this subject, you can read an article I wrote called Monotheism in Ancient Cultures is Virtually Non-Existent 
for more information on the false polytheistic gods of ancient times. It's important to note that in virtually every culture from Babylon, the uh, supreme beings were not a monotheistic god, but a male-female pairing, patterned on the worship of Nimrod and Semiramis of Babel. Also note that every one of these supreme beings spawned a pantheon of other false gods to be worshipped. If you have a male and female deity, is that the true God? No, of course not. And we know that from a lot of what the Bible teaches. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sandy Simpson, and I want to introduce you to a series uh, on DVD, a four-part series, on what is called the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People Movement. Now, if you live in the U.S. or Europe, you may not have been exposed to one of the most widespread heresies out there today. Mike Oppenheimer of Let Us Reason Ministries and myself of Apologetics Coordination, Coordination Team began to run into these teachings in the mid-80s, after reading Don Richardson's book, Eternity in Their Hearts, and Danny Kukawa's Perpetuated in Righteousness. After 2000, we finally produced this DVD series and the book called Idolatry in Their Hearts to inform Christians about what's going on in hundreds of churches, organizations, movements, Bible translation societies, and others who have allowed the influences of the New Apostolic, emergent church, and especially the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People movement into their midst. Now, likely only those Americans who've had close personal contact with First Nations Native American cultures might be aware about what's going on with this movement. The World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People movement or First Nations movement is an unbiblical movement teaching heresies and doctrines of demons. A lot of the inspiration for the movement comes from Don Richardson's books such as Peace Child and Eternity in Their Hearts. Now it's being spread worldwide by YWAM. Um, it was in the Perspectives course that came from uh, Ralph DeWinter and Don Richardson who actually wrote uh, a lot in it, uh, Fuller Seminary, and a number of Bible translation societies. The World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People is full of the false teachings of the Third Wave, New Apostolic Reformation, Word of Faith, Dominionism, Latter Rain, and many other theological systems. But it does have its own distinctives that are driven by the works of Daniel Kukawa, Richard Twist, and Don Richardson in particular. What they're doing is teaching Christians to redeem their cultures by worshiping their supreme beings from the past, pretending then that they are YHWH. They claim that all you need to do is go back in your culture, find the supreme being, claim he is the same as YHWH, and, and add Jesus to the mix, because all the nations that formed at Babel brought with them the worship of the true God. And he not only created those Gentile cultures, but has been working within their religious practices and mythologies and culture to keep at least a few in the past faithful to the true God. What they're doing is actually teaching a new radical form of inclusivism and replacement theology. <clears throat> of course, these teachings are deadly dangerous from a biblical perspective. The Bible is clear that the Gentiles did not know God, which is repeated over and over again in many different ways. Here's a few of those verses. Galatians 4.8, you did not know God, talking about the, the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 1.21, the world through wisdom, wisdom did not know God. 1 John 3.1, it did not know Him, the world. Romans 1.28, they did not think it worth to retain the knowledge of God. This is what happened after Babel. 1 Thessalonians 4.5, the Gentiles who do not know God. 
Ephesians 2, 12, and 13, probably the strongest statement on this fact, says that the Gentiles are without hope and without God in the world. And finally, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why evangelism is so incredibly important. You know, you cannot find the true God in a pantheon of false gods. In fact, all the ancient cultures from Babylon brought with them what's called polytheism, worship of multiple gods. In fact, in particular, a male and female deity, which they got from Babel through the worship of Nimrod and Semiramis. They did not bring or understand monotheism. To make matters worse, worse some of the largest Bible translation societies bought into Don Richardson's false arguments and methods and began the practice of finding the name of supreme beings in cultures that they were translating the Bible for and putting those names in the Bible. Case in point is that now around 90% of Arabic Bibles translated by those same agencies have put Allah as the name of YHWH. This is blasphemy. You know, this is their new plan of attack. Here's a statement from Wycliffe on their modus operandi. From the outset, one has to deal with identifying the name of the supreme being God. This can be difficult and potentially divisive. However, each language and culture appears to have within it a homing instinct for God. Oh, really? Deeply buried by the sin and corruption that affects all cultures, yet still there. Each religion has a different understanding of deity that's based on <clears throat> how the supreme being is defined. The characteristics of the local deity must be identified so it can be determined how these will impact the understanding of God. Is it possible for any language to totally explain the meaning of God? Or is there a need to add further definition or explanation? The ch challenge is to identify what intrinsic capacity exists within the language and help provide the meaning of God. Hmm, don't we go to the Bible to help provide the meaning of God? Since that's who the Lord revealed himself to was his people Israel, and then finally to the Gentiles through Paul, etc. Here's a similar statement from the Society of Biblical Literature, which is the American Bible Society. Uh, that's what, what they belong to. And here it is. The Old Testament names for God are not unambiguous, and there are many different names of God. In view of multi-religious and multi-textual uh, traditions, <clears throat> where there are long literary histories of God and or orally transmitted articulations of the divine, naming the biblical God in indigenous cultures is far more profound than just a linguistic transitional issue. And they go on to say, there's an un unwarranted skepticism toward the heathen's possession if at all, of a very limited and low knowledge of the divine from the so-called natural native religion. Oh, really? That's not what we read in the Bible. The adoption of a local name for the universal God will facilitate mutual transformation of both Christianity and the native religion and culture. Hmm, has it done that in Japan where they use the word kami? Which is actually a pantheon of false gods? No. They're the least evangelized nation on earth. You know, these are just two quotes <clears throat> right from Wycliffe and SBL pages that show that they're, they've not read their Bibles. <laughs> How can a Bible translation society not read their Bible? And they've not read it in regards to the revelation of who God is and to whom he revealed himself. The main reason for the seriousness of this subject is that it's leading toward a global false religion where every supreme being is proclaimed to be God. The next step is that mission organizations must apologize for bringing the gospel message when salvific religion was already present, where they sent missionaries. This is what they actually teach. You know, when I heard Daniel Kikawa apologize to the Japanese people, who, again, are the least evangelized people in the world, I sent that clip out to hundreds of missions, colleges, and ministries. Let's take a look at it. As a member of the International Reconciliation Coalition Board, Daniel believes that it's important to let the Japanese people know that God loves them just the way they are. 
we have told you that your culture was not honorable and not good enough for God. As an American Christian, I want to ask you for forgiveness for that. アメリカ人クリスチャンとしてそのことを今本当に皆さんの前でお詫びしたいと思います。And tell you that God has left so much beauty in your culture. 日本の文化の中に多くの美しいものを残しておられます。And, uh, please, I want to do this to say, please forgive me. どうか許してほしいと思います。Now, you know, I thought people would be outraged at what he did. Instead, the level of response I got back was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Christians are woefully uninformed on this issue, and I highly recommend that you get this series and learn about this new attack of the enemy on the churches. Now, this series,、uh, the DVD series,、uh, features the following segments DVD 1. Perpetuating Nations Myths by Mike Oppenheimer. And number two, 11、uh, Reasons to Reject This Movement, Part One by myself. DVD two, The Fingerprints of God, Mike Oppenheimer. And 11 Reasons to Reject This Movement, Part Two by myself. DVD three, The New Indigenous Christian Religion, and all of these are by me. Did God put eternity in their hearts?、Question、mark The missionaries brought a foreign god and Catholic syncretism. And finally, DVD 4, monotheism, quote unquote, in ancient cultures, and the history of the knowledge of God. You know what? I believe it's time for true believers to make their voices heard on this subject. Now, I'm offering this four DVD series at $25 per set plus shipping and handling. Which is $10 off the original price. So I want you to order this set at this special price. And if you want to do that, you need to go to this special URL that I have up on the screen. <laughs> 